just before you start, one minor but not wholly unimportant point, because these things are a real irritation. We um, drew to your attention yesterday that all the cases, some of the cases in the reports were um, not in the correct form, uh, but they're still not. Harold Ambers, we've been given in the All Englands, but it's, it exists in the appeal cases. And I actually see the same is true of Unison, which must probably be in the appeal cases as well. I don't know who was responsible for putting the bundle together. Well, that would be, I take responsibility for that bundle. I'm sure you didn't do it personally, but I think clerks sometimes don't understand what the rules are, but I'm afraid this council's of responsibility to see that they do understand what the rules are. And where cases are in the official law reports, that's the version we want to have. Could you just kindly, after the hearing, supply us to have those sent over? Um, uh, but we'll obviously manage what we've got at the moment. Thank right, thank you. Um, on the basis I have 20 minutes left, I would propose... Well, we, uh, I've now used up two of them. Um, <laughs> we will uh, reluctantly, if you really need them, uh, give you till half past. Um, but uh, since you were planning for 20 minutes, I won't dissuade you. <laughs> I, I will try my best, my lord. That's the question to my edge over in better mind. Um, the, 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 I propose to deal with Darren for 10 yeah, minutes and let's... then open justice. Uh, Darren, I'm sure you could deal with for 10 minutes, but I'm not so sure about open justice, but you're the one to say. Yep. In that bit, just before we leave Harold Ambers, can I ask you please to read paragraph 61 so that we don't have to come back to it? <coughs> I'm at the risk of stating the obvious. Uh, Harold Ambers is a case about a substantive claim review, is that right? Judicial review of uh, a magistrate's approval hearing of a warrant, yes. Yes, I know, but when they, they're talking about closed procedure and open justice and gisting and so on, what are they referring to? Uh, presumably the closed material procedure in the High Court. But both, they dealt with so whether the magistrate could hold a closed material procedure in the sense of relying on materials that couldn't subsequently be to the subject of the warrant, and secondly, what the judicial review court should do if it has. Um, with that, I want to now take you first to paragraph 11 of the High Court in Derham, which was my lady's judgment. Um, that's behind tab 11. Paragraph. It's, I'm simply making the point that Darren wasn't deciding the points you're being asked to decide. Yes, so which paragraph were you referring to? Sorry, 93 is, Nine. is the key one, my lord. Yep, thank you. Yep. Then I want to take you back to show you what 
time. This is the investigation. This is why we, should, we think it should continue. So yes, I can accept that there may be cases where, where it's at an early stage or HMRC are sort of teasing out a possible <coughs> rule or something serious. And the, the concerns raised um, in, in Derrick at 68 apply with full vigor. But equally, it is necessary to acknowledge there'll be cases where that isn't true. And, and cases like the present one where there where it's been going on for sort of four or five years at the time, there's detailed evidence on the scope of the inquiry and why it should continue in the closure notice application. So it, you can't you can't jump from the, the particular to the general is essentially my submission. But the second submission is that even in the, even in cases where there is such a danger, the approach of the Supreme Court in Harold Ambush shows that it's wrong to ban all. Must consider whether there, if if in principle participation might be a good idea for the reasons I was submitting on earlier, that there's a concern. The existence of, of potentially confidential information or information that should be made public doesn't mean that you must nip that in the bud at that stage. It simply means you have to consider how to deal with that issue. And as the, the Supreme Court decision in Haralamba shows, there are ways of dealing with. The answer in how Olympus was that yes, the judicial review court can hold a closed materials procedure. Equally, the magistrate can hold a closed materials procedure. So there is procedural flexibility to deal with those concerns, but therefore doesn't lead to an absolute prohibition. And the third point is to bear in mind that in light of the ancillary protections referred to in Haralambus, namely that after the hearing, the person to whom the order relates, the direction relates, should be told essentially what happened at the hearing, subject to withholding information that can't be disclosed for um, public interest immunity reasons. Makes it far less powerful reason why they should the taxpayer should be allowed to, to hear what is said at the hearing. If they're going to find out afterwards, subject to public interest immunity, and that's sort of withholding, then there's, there's less force in the submission they shouldn't be heard at the time. Is it clear they are going to be told afterwards? Well, that, that in my submission, is, is the logical effect of, of those ancillary protections referred in Harold Ambers. Well, that was, in the, that was in the context of Harold Ambers. didn't mean there'd be such a power in a case like this. But the it reason is your submission. It is your submission that those ancillary protections, refer, those after-the-event notifications referred to in Harold Ambers read across to the present case. It is, and my understanding is that that, that is what happened. Um, it, may, it may be. I just didn't know that. Believe in, I haven't got the reference to hand, but I'm not, believe in possibly Darren, there was a note of the hearing was provided by HMRC so the taxpayer could see what had happened. Yeah. <coughs> so t taking those points together, the fact that A, Darren doesn't deal with these issues, B, you can't lead from the particular to the general in the sense that, yes, there may be cases where the nature of what is under investigation does preclude any form of participation, does not lead to a general rule that therefore the tribunal in no case may consider participation. And see, even in cases where there is a danger, if the tribunal was so minded and thought it was appropriate, there are ways of dealing with that. Darren is not therefore the authority um, that might be set against me to, to decide this case um, in such a way that there's no power. Darren wasn't considering this issue. He was considering, actually, as you can see at 81, a far more far broader proposition than in all cases. Um, persons who are not actually the name taxpayer should be given um, a summary of the reasons why HMRC thinks the information is necessary. So it, it, it has useful guidance. It makes the point about it being a judicial monitoring system, but it doesn't go so far as to decide this case. For the reasons I've given, um, the logic there doesn't necessitate and doesn't lead to a conclusion against me. That's what I wanted to say about Darren. 
I have to rely on my skeleton argument to deal with, for example, units, because I won't have time to deal with the force division. Mm -hmm. You've got that point in mind. So it's very relevant. Therefore, I propose to deal with open chest as swiftly as possible. This, this, as I, I said this morning, is, is the question of attendance, not participation. The upper tribunal decision on this respect, in this respect, sorry, is in the hearing bundle, and it's towards the end, it's paragraphs 87 and 88. You, the, the logic of 87 is that it will be implied unless a compelling reason is shown why the hearing must be or should be happening. And then in 88, the only justification, positive justification as to why this hearing or indeed hearings generally in these applications should be in private is in the fourth, fourth line, Miss Anderson's submission to the hearing made it clear that HMRC's concern was a general one. If the submission to the hearing were held in public, the natural dialogue between them and the judge considering the application could well result in HMRC having to reveal details of their investigation that they would prefer to taxpayers not to know. Yes. My submission is that this, this issue falls within the scope of Rule 32, which I showed you this morning hearings must be in public unless certain criteria are met. And furthermore, that the test for whether to hold a, uh, a hearing in private um, is, is essentially that which applies in generally and which in my submission is accurately encapsulated in the practice direction, um, which is behind tab three, paragraphs 10 to, 10 to 13. We have some of those cases in the bundle, but in the interest of time, and given I'm, the court's likely to be familiar with these issues, um, I, I just simply invite you to, to turn up the, the practice direction. And then I'm going to com compare what's said there with what the upper tribunal reads. It's a very different approach. Yes. Yeah. First point is that it's only justified in exceptional circumstances. It must be strictly necessary. Second, it's not a question of discretion, but of obligation. That's paragraph 11. Third, the, the test is whether nothing short of the exclusion of the public is required. And you must consider whether something short of exclusion is required. And then paragraph 13, the burden is on the person seeking the der derogation. It must be established by clear and cogent evidence. Well, if that is the test, and in my submission it is the correct test, it's obvious that that's not the test the upper tribunal applied. You see in 87, the upper tribunal said compelling reasons would be required why this should be held. Well, that's, that's the opposite. Paragraph 88. The only positive point made in favour is the general submission that HMRC have a general concern about the nature of the dialogue and having to reveal details of their investigation. Sorry, just will you forgive me? It's a point I asked you before. I don't think you gave me a chapter and verse answer. Um, what is the requirement that, that where the application is made ex parte, there be a hearing? 
Rule 29. Sorry, perhaps you did. Oh, sorry, Rule 19 deals with ex parte um, applications, but then the, the one requiring a hearing is Rule 29 on Rule 26. But if this is an ex parte hearing, what is the requirement to have a hearing? To, to subject to 32.4. You mean 32.4? Yes, it's rule 29 must hold a hearing for making a decision which disposes of proceedings unless each party is consented or Sorry, I'm being slow. Um, and then 32, mm. subject to the following paragraphs, all hearings must be held in public. And then 32, 2, may give a direction if but, justified for but, these reasons. The, the entitlement to attend is subject to Rule 19. Rule 19 deals with participation, not attendance. Rule 32 deals with attendance. My Lord picked up on that point this morning that in Rule 32.3 it talks about attendance of persons who are clearly not going to be the, or may not be the taxpayer or other interested party. I mean, uh, well, I suppose it comes back to the debate we had earlier. And I, I, nothing more you want to add on the question of whether this is proceedings. I can't help feeling that given the model, which is not unlike the model of applying for a search warrant for magistrates or something. Uh, Rule 29 wouldn't be thought to be applying to it. You say it has to be because it disposes of proceedings, the proceedings being the application for approval. Well, that, that, that's, that's it, isn't it? The rules only apply to FTC proceedings. If you go all the way back to Rule 1. I see that. No, no, I understand that. So either, either these rules just simply don't apply and we have no alternative, it's yep. up in the air, or they do apply because they're proceedings. In my submission, they are proceedings because they are in the nature of de decisions following a procedure before the FTC. And, and these, these um, rules must apply. I mean, I, I can understand my Lord's point that maybe it might have been better to treat certain sets of proceedings outside the scope of these rules or deal with them in a different way. but. These rules deal with originating applications, we've seen that. And references. And references. Yes, yeah, so I have no idea whether this is an originating application or a reference. You weren't able to help on this. Uh, originating application is, is, is dealt with in Rule 21. And, I mean, originating application is an application not part of other proceedings rather than respectively submitted. So, okay, the, the Schedule 36 talks about an application to Tribunal. Ms. Anderson gave us a, a, a template for the application uh, during the course of the short adjournment, at least I think uh, she must have done, and that says the application is made under Rule 21, which is the originating yeah. application. Well, it looks like you're right. Um, it's been puzzling me, but uh, everyone's proceeding on that basis, and I will uh, stop asking you about it. <laughs> I'm grateful, my lord. So that means we are into Rule 32. We're into the normal case law on public versus private hearings, which means the, the rules set out in the practice direction apply, and compared to those rules, the test applied by the upper tribunal is not the right test. It starts in the proposition that I must provide a convincing reason why it should be in public, whereas we know from the practice direction in the case law, the must, convincing reason must be provided why it should be in private. Equally, it must be supported by clear and cogent evidence. And a submission from counsel, and with, with respect, as we know, is not, is not evidence. It's a generalized concern. And equally, and thirdly, you must consider whether something less than exclusion will meet the concern. And that's why it's important to consider it on a case-by-case -case basis. Because the, 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 the system is, whoever has the concern brings forward their concern with clear and cogent evidence. If it made out that there is a concern, then you consider, is that something less than exclusion that's going to do justice to it? And only if the answer to that is no, then you go to exclusion. <coughs> but that's why it's important to have clear and cogent evidence and a specific rather than a generalized risk that may or may not apply in this case uh, and, and 
may or may not justify exclusion. So in my respectful submission, it's quite obvious that the test at 8788 is not the test set under practice direction and in the case law. So unless this court concludes that this is an area where that test doesn't apply, then it follows that the other tribunal has applied the wrong test. And if you apply the correct test, then the answer is that there's no clear and cogent evidence of a specific risk by nothing less than exclusion of the public would be necessary. So the test is just not met. Suppose, Mr. Firth, we accepted ground two. And I'm not giving any indication, even a provisional one. No, I understand. I just want to know what would follow. Would you invite this court then to perform that exercise, or would you invite us to remit it? And if remit it, is that to the UT or to the FTT? I think, consistent with what I said at the beginning about what should happen if ground one is allowed, you should remit it to the FTT so that HMRC can have an opportunity to make out their case as to why. Can I also ask you, was Rule 32 drawn to the attention of the UT? I don't think they mentioned it in their judgment, did they? Yes, it was. At least just over my post-hearing submissions, at the very least, it was referred to in there. My lords, my ladies, my ladies, with five minutes to spare, I think I've concluded my submission. You've done very well. Just one moment. You referred, I think, at one point this morning to the skeleton arguments that were before the upper tribunal. I think it would be useful for us to see those. Thank you. Not to take any new points on them, but just it helps get an overall view of how the case is put. There were post-hearing submissions specifically on the open justice point, which I assume would be useful for you to see as well. Certainly. May I ask one question? Yes. In the upper tribunal judgment, they largely follow the reasoning of the first-tier tribunal in a case called Eames, which we have in our bundle of authorities. But they said that they weren't going to deal with it in detail because E itself, they said, was subject to an appeal to the upper tribunal. And my question for both of you, really, is whether you were able to help us on whether E did go to the upper tribunal and whether there's been a judgment of the upper tribunal. I don't believe there has, but I'm open to correction if my learned friend knows better than me on that. No, that's fine, because we have the first-tier tribunal judgment in our bundle of authorities, which says it helps. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Firth. Yes, Ms. Allison. I'm sorry you've got not a huge amount of time, but as the party going second, you don't need as much time because a lot of the ground has been covered. My lord, rather than stick to any particular format pre-prepared, as it were, I think the most useful way to deal with this time is to deal with the submissions that have been made today. I'm saying that so that nothing in my skeleton argument is abandoned or treated as not being pursued. It's simply to focus on what's happened at the oral hearing. My lord, just to start at the very beginning, the question that my lord, Lord Justice Underhill, posed about jurisdiction, because this first question is a jurisdictional question. In my submission, the jurisdiction for this process is in Schedule 36 itself. So there's no other sort of provision. There might be appeal jurisdictions that are given by different bits of the Finance Act, etc., in respect of certain decisions. But in this case, it is Schedule 36 that's the source of the first-tier tribunal's jurisdiction. And it's, of course, common ground that any approval, judgment, or determination, whatever, it's not really even on either of those. Actually, language doesn't help us in this situation. There's no appeal, because it's not a decision as such that can be appealed. It can only be judicially reviewed. So if we look at Schedule 36, 
what jurisdiction does Schedule 36 give to the first tier tribunal? And you've seen the authorities, um, my lord and my lady, so I won't um, go over it, but it's very clear that it's a monitoring jurisdiction. And it's, in many ways, one could imagine that if you change the language and you didn't use the language of um, hearings and judgments and parties and proceedings, um, it would be a very straightforward situation, in a sense. Um, where the um, confusion, or perhaps the complexity has come from, is that the first tier tribunal has chosen to apply a hearing procedure to that jurisdiction. So the jurisdiction itself is very clear. It's the jurisdiction to consider, and there's a couple of other points, but principally, whether the information requested by the notice or required by the notice is reasonably um, required for the investigation. So that's the nature of the question. Sorry, can I just help, ask you how you said that the FTT has chosen to apply a hearings procedure, and that has been worrying me. But it now seems to be clear, especially now we've seen the application, that it's common ground that this is an this is an originating application under the rules, and the FTT had no choice because. Um, of uh, rule, whatever it was, we were saying. Yeah. Um, well, I think, my lord, my lady, this is the, the great dilemma, as it were, that whether um, the rules, the procedural rules, shape the jurisdiction, as it were, or whether the jurisdiction is there. And um, to, to put the point um, on the basis of the statutory provisions, there's nothing in Schedule 36 that says when you decide whether to approve something, um, that you need to even have any kind of in-person hearing or any kind of in-person process or even an examination of the officer who's applied for approval. There could be a completely paper um, situation. Yes, well, that's rather what I thought. And but. So, but what the tribunal has elected to do, um, and I don't have any instructions on the point, but my understanding is the form is just something that someone's written it were. So to um, what can't be sort of implied into it is a reasoned decision by HMRC as to the um, All right, but the it, I, I don't understand um, you to be saying, but if you are, we ought to know that this isn't, this procedure is not an originating application under the rules. Well, my lords, this is the point, that it doesn't come from Schedule 36, that you must have an application of this nature and it must be dealt with by a hearing and it must be. So there's nothing in Schedule 36 that says this is the procedure by which you do this. So procedure, it's clear what must be done. What must be done is consideration of those statutory questions and um, for the tribunal to decide do you approve or don't you approve. Well, you yes, have to make an application for approval. Yes, you have to make an application. Right. Um, so the, and, so the, and the form says that the application for approval is made under Rule 21. Are you saying that it isn't? All I'm saying is, I'm, I'm just giving a little health warning to what the form says, as it were. It's well, not what's your case? Behind Forget the about the form. What's your um, case on the base of how the basis on which the application is made? That um, it's quite right that the statutory provision says you must make an application. Yeah. Under the procedural rules at the moment, as they're drafted, um, there's provisions for certain types of application, and one of them is an originating um, application, and that is apparently the most suitable because of the nature of of um, what's being applied for if that's the way of putting it. Um, and so I'm not contesting that um, it's done in this way, um, sort of rightly or wrongly. I'm simply pointing out that it's done in this way because that's how the procedural rules are crafted. Well, right, but the, 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 you, you, you're right in a sense that the procedure rules can't shape the jurisdiction. That one sense is obviously true, but throughout the whole of the... Um, statutory tribunals, they have some jurisdictions, but the jurisdiction says this tribunal has jurisdiction, and the 2007 Act gives a rulemaking power as to how the various jurisdictions should be exercised so far as practice and procedure is concerned. Absolutely. So you're stuck with, you're slightly hinting that, well, we've chosen to go under Rule 21. You had to go under Rule 21. Yes, um, my lord, it is just my concern that what seems to be happening 
is that the practice and procedure is shaping the jurisdiction. And it is just that very simple point that you have a jurisdiction first set by Parliament, and Parliament <coughs> sets this task. And this is consistent with the authorities the, of the higher courts, which I'll show you, that say if you look at what Parliament says, you look at the statutory scheme, and that's where you find the but jurisdiction. But, but, but forgive me um, for interrupting you. Mr. Firth is not, uh, that's not his submission, as I understand. He accepts the jurisdiction of the tribunal is as set out in primary legislation. But he says that that jurisdiction is to determine the HMRC's application for approval of a third party notice. That's the jurisdiction. How you determine it, he says, first of all, there's nothing in Schedule 36 which tells you how you determine it. And secondly, it's perfectly natural, therefore, to go to the secondary legislation, namely the procedure rules, in order to see how the FTT should go about determining an application. Uh, but that's all conventional stuff, isn't it? Um, absolutely, my lord. But the point that really is um, coming from this, though, is that if the procedure, um, if the procedure rules allowed for something, as it were, um, then you must be able to do it. Whereas if what we have here in my submission is a, a conflict almost, or a tension at the very least, between the purpose of the statutory scheme and the um, uh, objectives, and even what the statu statutory scheme specifies must be taken into account, what must be done, um, if there's a tension between that and what's implied by procedure and practice rules, then it must always be the statutory scheme that wins out as it were, because that mm. is the source of the jurisdiction. And that's really just the point I'm making, that we look at the statutory scheme first, and then, of course, the procedural rules can say how that jurisdiction is exercised in practice <laughs> and in procedure. But what you can't do is if you haven't <coughs> got it in the statutory provisions, you've got it in the rules, but the rules lead you to do something that's in conflict with the statutory scheme, then what must give is the rules not the statutory scheme. You don't start reshaping the statutory scheme and changing the nature of it um, because you've got to accommodate a rule. And we have spent quite a long time this morning trying to fit rules that aren't really very well suited into um, the situation. And my, submission, <coughs> my opening submission is we have to be very clear about what the statutory scheme requires. And it, it's obviously there are two sources of additional matters as it were, and we can look and we will come to Wiseman, and, and Wiseman says you might have something in the statutory scheme that says you can have this practice and procedure, or you can do it in this way, um, or natural justice might tell you you have to do it in this way, and so that might be the additional source, not in the statutory scheme, but I'll come to my submissions on it, but you'll see very clearly what the court says is that's very unusual to supplement a statutory scheme, and you mustn't do it, you must only do it when um, natural justice demands it, so you have to have an unfair procedure without this addition, without this supplementation, and you can't do it in a way that conflicts or undermines the statutory scheme and the purpose thereof. So, um, in my submission, we have to start very clearly with what the jurisdiction is in the statutory scheme, and um, see how that, uh, what that requires in terms of practice and procedure and not start the other way around and just say, well, you have to, you're having a hearing, therefore you must be doing this, and you must be doing it in this way, and you must be doing it the other way. Keep the focus on the statutory scheme, and that will tell you the answers to what is consistent and isn't consistent with the statutory scheme. So, um, if we uh, look at the actual question in this case, because this did come up, we can see the actual terms of the permission to appeal that was granted in this case of, of um, the first point. Um, and the tribunal put it in a rather a neutral way, that's in the core bundle. And you'll see that the tribunal itself sort of crafted a um, page 83 behind tab 6 at the beginning of it. And right at the end of the tribunal's um, decision, paragraph 13, page 86, you can see that's what the actual permission was given there, concluding that the FTT lacked jurisdiction to direct that the Schedule 36 application be dealt with on anything other than a without notice basis. And by that, the tribunal in my submission was trying to encapsulate sort of all the elements, as it were, 
over um, what had been requested. Just to complete this, um, was there any uh, um, yes there was wasn't there um, permission to appeal from the FTT to the UT there was a reasoned decision which we have at 107 yes. but that's presumably consistent or at any rate not inconsistent and, and actually just while we're doing the headline points of course what happened was um, in, there were two FTT decisions but we only have to worry about one um, as it were, because the other one was to do with closure notices and what have you. So, um, if you see mention of two FTT decisions, you have to be a little bit careful about which one you're looking at. And these two points that um, the appeal, um, in, a, in a sense, is um, there's the adversarial process of part of the appeal, then there's the um, open in public aspect of it. Of course, the FTT considered that you shouldn't hold these hearings in public. So made a decision um, that there wasn't jurisdiction to hold the hearings in public. The upper tribunal differed on that, um, but then remade the decision and decided that in this particular case um, it shouldn't be in public. There's no cross appeal, so the um, HMIC are not challenging the upper tribunal decision that there's jurisdiction in principle. Um, and you'll see that the HMIC have reserved the position at this level on that, um, on the basis that these matters are really best worked through in a case where the first tier tribunal considers it should be in public and so you'll have real reasons and a real substantive basis against which to um, apply the case law and the principles and decide um, where where it lies. But sometimes doing these things in abstract in a case where the, the first tier tribunal hadn't thought it appropriate and neither have the upper tribunal um, to have this particular uh, exercise, we can call it that in public, then um, it's not the most helpful way to, to deal with that. So that's why in this court I'm bound to accept that in principle natural justice, not natural justice, I'm sorry, open justice principles and the hearing could be in public in principle. Um, you'll see that the approach that the first tier tribunal has taken is to say that generally these hearings aren't, they're generally in private. Um, and so there is something slightly more than an individual discretion in every case. There is a sort of um, practice, if that's the way of putting it, in the first tier tribunal that they are held in private. Um, but it doesn't exclude the possibility that there might be a cross appeal. Sorry, just, just while I'm dotting I's and crossing T's, I think I was wrong to say that the upper tribunal gave permission from the FTT. The FTT itself gave yes, permission. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Do we have that? Um, I'll just have to double check that because as I say there were two different places for yes um, I, at the moment I don't see that we have it and yeah. I think for completeness we ought to have it yeah we'll make sure that comes in uh, all the upper tribunal did was give directions about it yeah. I think it might be 104 and 105 yeah that's right. oh, well there you are my lord my lady have read the yes it's... they have I'm so sorry yeah. yes well there you are we do it Sorry to have stayed, stayed you up. I mean, that's certainly one of them. Um, so that's the grant, and then there was a refusal yeah. of the appeal against the stay yeah. at the FTT level. Yeah. So. Thank you. But so far as this court is concerned, we, of course, are seas of the appeal for which permission was granted by the upper tribunal. Yeah. And that's at page 86, which you were just showing us. Yeah. The grounds as formulated might be said to be broad enough, certainly ground one, doesn't appear on its face to be confined to the question of an oral inter-parties hearing. Yes. And the way, the way in which they formulate the issue earlier on the same page at paragraph 12, it's quite interesting. Uh, they say, the statute does not say expressly whether or not the FTT has any jurisdiction where HMRC apply without notice to direct that HMRC's application should be determined following a contested inter partes procedure. Now, again, as I read 
that doesn't confine itself to the issue of whether they have power to direct an oral inter-parties hearing. On its face, that seems to be saying we have no power, you know, without notice case, to pursue any contested inter-parties procedure. Yes, I think that's definitely my understanding of it, my Lord. I think their concern was they didn't want to close down the issues for this court, because you can see the position is, generally, that the first tier tribunal who deal with this are unanimous. There are quite a few, I haven't got all the decisions in here, but there's some 14 or so decisions on the issue at first tier tribunal level, and they're the ones who actually do the accrual process function. That the High Court has, on a couple of occasions, expressed discomfort or concern, but not in cases where it's been an indirect issue. And, of course, in Daring, it's accepted that this point wasn't an indirect issue. So my understanding is the tribunal would be welcoming guidance on a more general basis than this individual case, as it were, the facts of this case. However, in this particular case, very clearly what was sought was an inter-parties adversarial hearing, and the term adversarial was used. And the reason for that was that there was a concern that the HMRC officer would, either, would in some way mislead the tribunal in the hearing, and therefore it's necessary to be present at the hearing as one thing, to see the misleading, and secondly, obviously, if jurisdiction allows, to be able to address the tribunal. And that's why the submissions are being made to the FTT, that's quite clear in the direction, B, to address any misleading, as it were. So it is... The UT, I don't know if this helps you, Ms. Anderson, but on page 84 of that decision, at paragraph 4, there's a summary of what the FTT decided, and number 2 makes clear that it was deciding no power to grant an adversarial hearing application in which the appellants requested full rights to argue at an oral inter-parties hearing that the FTT should not approve the application. I'm grateful, my lady. So there's no doubt that in this particular case, that's what's being asked for, but it is notable how it was crafted by the Office of Tribunal in terms of the permission to appeal, and it may be that the tribunal would welcome wider guidance. In my submission, my lord, it actually comes down to the same thing in the end, because this is a situation where the courts have said there, unfortunately, isn't really a middle way, that you either have, you either say statute provided for the taxpayer or the third party receiving the notice, or perhaps one of these entities whose information might be seen at the same time as the taxpayer's information, because there's a not great issue there, because obviously there might be information with transactions with other parties, that the statute doesn't provide for them to have an opinion and to provide that opinion to the first tier tribunal on whether or not the information is reasonably required for the purposes of the investigation. And so in that circumstance, it is my submission that there isn't really room for a middle way, that you either have a role, and that role is making submissions on the questions, the merits of the question itself, and that's what a hearing is concerned with. Is this right? We were told by Mr. Firth this morning that the practice is that these applications by HMRC are in fact considered at a hearing. Again, we're coming back to the definition of hearing. There's an in-person examination by the tribunal, usually, of the officer who's applying for the approval. Yes, but I think I understand that. It's not just a judicial officer sitting in their room reading a file. Is that right? Well, it could be. Under the rules, it's really up to the tribunal how they wish to proceed. And even the rule my learned friend keeps relying on to say they must have a hearing, but quite clearly says unless the tribunal decides it doesn't want to have a hearing. And so there may be some applications. Is that right? I'm sorry. Forgive me if this is another red herring. I want to be absolutely sure that's right. 
29 is this. Um, 29B, my lord, 1B, sorry. 29B, tribunal considers it's able yes, to but that's, the matter without it. No, no, but that's, that's and A. Oh, okay. They're not alternatives. Um, of course, then it comes back to who's each party. But actually, my lord, there's something in, I'll, I will come back to you on this, but there's something, um, Judge Mosedale, who I must commend to you is excellent, Lori Clara, um, does on one of the um, applications talk about whether to have a hearing, the, the discretion of the tribunal whether to have a hearing generally, and it's quite clear that the tribunal always has a discretion whether to have a hearing. Well, that's what I would have expected, but I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Well, what's a How default this... paper case? Rule 26. Yeah. Which is a, a case determined without a hearing. It's defined uh, by reference to Rule 23. Case is disposed of without a hearing. <laughs> yes. I hesitate to cut across my letter from what she's looking for, but the answer is in Rule Um, Judge Mosedale, um, behind tab 21, there's a decision of Judge Mosedale, um, who's somewhat of a memory from the first year of Crimean War. And page 491, you can see the first question she decides on the subparagraph 2 at the top there, um, or paragraph 2 at the top, is, is whether or not to hold a hearing in that particular case of the consideration of whether or not to have a Interpartes hearing, as it were. So, um, what, what's reasons, the rule basis? She doesn't say. Um, well, she. Uh, oh, she does she it. Does. Paragraph, paragraph seven. Paragraph seven under there says, "Are not required to hold a hearing. The tribunal rules only require tribunal to hold a hearing before making a decision which disposes of proceedings." Mm. Yeah. I, I I had read that, and that, that that's actually what lay behind some of my questions, which which may or not have been well founded, but. What we're dealing with in the present context doesn't obviously strike one as being the disposal of proceedings. But it may be. Um, Mr. Firth says it is. Well, I think it may be um, in this context. I think we're coming right back, settling back to the beginning. Well, hang on. If, 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 if it is, then, then you do need to have a hearing. I, I think what she's saying is, I don't, because it isn't. Yes, for the particular question she had in front of her there. Um, but what she says... She doesn't say why. I mean, she says it's not a decision which will dispose of the proceedings if the proceedings are, as I think they should be, the Schedules 36 application by HMRC. Yes. That is an application for approval, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I, I just. Well, sorry, let me just follow this through. If the proceedings are the application for approval, why doesn't the decision dispose of it? I know Judge Moisel is a. No, no, that's what I was trying to draw to your attention. Oh, sorry. Judge, because I, I don't think I made it clear enough that what she's deciding in this question is just whether to have a hearing about that. And that particular question she's deciding whether or not to um, have her consideration of whether or not an adversarial hearing is jurisdiction, etc., etc. That's what she's referring to there. She very clearly, that's what I was drawing to your attention. Oh, she I see. That Schedule 36. Sorry, yes, you're quite right. I, I... So Schedule 36 is. This is about the, the, the hearing about whether there should be a hearing. Yeah. Oh, right. look, look, so that doesn't then, help. Though I yes. think that I'm sort of bound in that sense by um, Judge Mosedale finding that it's proceedings. 
Um, but well, you're not bad. Where, this well, not, but it, not at this level, but um, I'm not going to argue against it being proceedings in, in that sense. But um, it's quite what a hearing connotes. That the it's whether it's an oral adversarial hearing or. Um, well, no, forgive me. You've got to approach this in stages. If you accept that it's the disposal of proceedings, then Mr. Firth says, well, the starting point is there has to be a hearing. Well, do you accept that? I think the starting point is an ex parte process. Sorry, do you, do you accept there's a he there has to be a hearing? Um, no, I don't, my lord. Why it's, not? It's an ex parte process, and that ex parte nature of the process. I mean, well, it depends what you mean by hearing. I'm sorry. Well, exactly. Well, that is, is that, the point. It, it, no, I think my lord's. Um, well, whether it was my lord's point, it's certainly mine. Okay, I don't want to Your hearing doesn't mean an inter-parties hearing. Exactly. Yes. Um, we, we, if on that premise, absolutely. Yeah, I okay. accept. So, so, we got to the, so we got to that base. Yes. Right? Then the question becomes is there any power to make that an inter-parties hearing? And that, that's, as I understand it, that's the crucial issue yeah, for crucial. us to decide on this appeal, underground one. And where does the power come from to do that? Because if yes. the statute says this is what you must do, um, and uh, it's the procedural rules that say you must have a hearing or you must have this particular procedure, yes. can you say, oh, well, you must also do it in this particular way because of the procedural rules or because of something else, yes. where that would cut well, across? I think, I, well, I think the, the yeah. solution for Mr. Firth is a very straightforward one. The source of that power is that if that is what in the tribunal's assessment would be helpful in order to dispose of the application, sort of dispose of the proceedings, let's use that phrase, dispose of the proceedings fairly and efficiently, if that's what the tribunal thinks it would be assisted by doing, then Mr. Firth says, of course they have the power. If a tribunal would find it helpful to call on the other side, of course they can do it. They don't have to. They may not find it helpful. But if they do think it's going to be helpful, why should they not have the power? That, that's his simple submission. And the answer to that submission is that the statutory scheme is set up in a very particular way for a very particular reason. So even if the first tier tribunal thinks, oh, it would be more convenient to save me having to do some work, or I don't know what the motivation would be for getting some, rather than asking the questions to HMS C themselves, which is what they do, and say, what's the answer to this, and, and getting to, to get somebody else to sort of do the testing, which is really what's being suggested here, that you get the taxpayer or you get somebody else with an interest to come and sort of test the, instead of the um, judicial monitor testing the officer, you get someone else to stand in and, and do that testing. So can the um, first year tribunal do that? And my submission is very clearly no, because that's inconsistent with the statutory scheme. The statutory scheme put the judge as the monitor, not an arbiter, is not being the umpire between two conflicting cases and then deciding. This is more really, in some ways, it's not quite inquisitorial, because inquisitorial is very much a sort of questioning, testing, examination, investigation role. This isn't investigation, but what it is, is uh, a role where it's a judicial monitor, and it's simply not consistent with a judicial monitor that you open it up to the floor and you say, right, um, you know, it's the judge who must look at the application, look only at those questions, so, and the questions are very much not whether there should be a tax investigation, and that is what preoccupies, generally, the taxpayer. Um, and the question is not really whether um, it's too inconvenient, or there's some other matter that the, the person who's receiving the notice and a third party notice might have in mind. Those can be taken into account, but they're not showstoppers. The question is whether or not this information is reasonably required for the investigation. And to my submission, the opinions that count on that are HMRC officer and judicial monitor. It's not provided for that the opinions of others should be um, taken into account. But, and but, but, as I understand it, the, the procedure does, on any view, envisage that the third party may have made representations to HMRC, yes. and then HMRC do have a duty, an express duty, 
place a summary of those representations before the tribunal. Yes. Right. Suppose the tribunal judge is sitting there with the inspector in front of them making their application. They read the representations of the third party and they say, well, paragraph five, I don't really understand what paragraph five says. Why can't they then say, well, I'd like to know what is meant by paragraph five and ask the author of paragraph five? My lord, there's no difficulty with that because what's happening there is clarification of submissions that have been made. And that's not introducing an opinion on the question in issue. That's not inviting an opinion on whether it should reasonably be required. No, but they could only do that if they had already... Whether it should reasonably be required. Forgive me for interrupting you, but I'm sorry. They could only do that if they have first directed that blogs can attend the hearing and if it's appropriate to do so, will be called on to answer any questions the tribunal may have. If they can't, if they have no power to make such a direction, that's the end of the story. But, my lord, why would they only be able to do that by having an in-person sort of monitor monitoring the hearing and then if something crops up? Because they could simply put a request in for... In fact, what they could do is direct HMRC, which they could just refuse the application and direct HMRC to get information on that point. So it would go to the point itself. And if it's not clear... That's an incredibly convoluted approach. Any judge in the ordinary situation would say, there's this point that's troubling me. I'd like to get them here and explore it with them. Not say, I will stay the application or refuse the application until HMRC has put my point for me, me, the judge's point for me, to the... Well, my lord, it's not entirely judicial convenience that this is a statutory scheme, but it may not actually be more convenient because if the people are there for the hearing, stopping them making submissions on the underlying questions, if what you really want is further information about something confusing in submissions, then that's easily requested in writing or can be provided. But it's very difficult once the person is there, one, to fulfil the statutory purpose, which is not to reveal the context of the investigation at this preliminary stage, at this information-gathering stage, and not to decide the issues which may or may not end up being in dispute when it comes to charging tax. And it would be extremely difficult to stop, once you've allowed someone into the hearing, to actually stop them making submissions on the various matters, whether they weave them in cleverly under the guise of a point they're making in another way. But it's those key objectives of Parliament which cannot be transgressed in my submission. One is confidentiality and the freedom to have a discourse between the judicial monitor and the person proposing. And secondly, that this be an efficient and quick matter that can't be bogged down in disputes about all these matters. And you can see just how bogged down the disputes have been, even in this case, about records and individual personalities and all of those matters, which are not actually relevant to the question in my submission. But you can see how much time they take up, even if, as you can see, HMRC have not responded to the personal attacks, etc., etc. It's still occupying a lot of paper, a lot of submission. And so in my submission, I don't accept it being more convenient, but anyway, convenience must give to preserving those very key objectives, which are about faced by high authority, that the predecessor system and this system makes it very clear that what's envisaged here is an efficient operational system that actually performs its function, that you can, in an investigation, go, ask for approval of a notice and get it so that years of tax aren't falling out of charge behind you because your investigation can't move forward because you've got embroiled in inter partes or disputed litigation, to use a broad term. So it really does cut across the whole of that to say, well, a little bit here and a little bit there, why not do this, why not do that? Because always you go back to the statute and you say, what's intended here? And very clearly in Wiseman, and perhaps we could look at that, the court says if there's no actual unfairness, no actual injustice, then there really isn't a basis 
for supplementing the statutory um, scheme, and that you certainly can't do it if it's going to undermine the, the key purposes of your scheme, or any purpose of your scheme. And these are absolutely fundamental. There's high authority that the two fundamental statutory purposes here are to provide a process that allows for judicial sort of supervision, but without all the other matters that may sometimes come with it, which is, you know, um, litigation, delaying matters, and um, information in order to make the litigation operate properly, inter partes litigation. The court in Morgan Grenfell, you saw grappled with the fact that you can't really have a little bit, because a little bit's not really that helpful. You end up having to give the whole, to make sense of things, you, and to actually be able to make your submissions or understand your question or what have you. You have to put them in the same position, really, the person making the submissions as the other people involved, the judge and the HMRC officer. And so it's very hard to have the halfway house. And that is something that the first tier tribunal has considered, um, Judge Mosedow has considered um, in her judgment. So I won't take you to it because we're short of time, but I do commend to you the aerial judgment, which does look around um, quite a few of these mm. sort of points. Um, just while we're on um, re E, though, um, Mr. E, you might have it still open at um, tab 21. Sorry to take it out of sequence, but as we're there, we're at short of time. Can I just um, pick up a point that comes right at the end? Sorry, I'm actually in the wrong judgment, but uh, it's a judgment of Judge Mosdell. I'm sorry, if you're there, it's tab 16. And it comes out of something that, that happened this morning. On page 373, It's the footnote that's at paragraph 90, and I'd just like you to look at the footnote and then what comes after it, because it's the explanatory um, note to the provision that inserted paragraph 3 to A. Yes, that is, that's actually referred to by the upper tribunal, isn't it? Yeah, and um, you can see what was intended, because there was some debate this morning about what was intended, and whether it's achieved, of course, my lords and my lady, I do accept it different question whether the statutory language achieves the um, intention but you can see what the intention was there. Just on whether it's achieved um, no sorry this is this is a different point but it's, uh, perhaps you can just help me on it all the same it's about whether there has to be a hearing at all if necessary we'll go back to rule 29 but I don't think it's necessary uh, there doesn't have to be a hearing if each party consents and the tribunal doesn't think it's necessary in the context of what is explicitly an ex parte application who are each party well um, my lord put that question to my learned friend this morning and well i obviously he, put it without noticing he, i put he it had so. a, he had a very sort of broad approach to that um but perhaps not broad enough because if it's someone to whom the proceedings relate which is the wording of the rule then that would equally apply to all these offshore entities whose information will be handed over under the notices. This is, um, if we look at Darren, um, one of the arguments in Darren was the Article 8 rights of those whose, those entities. Um, I call them entities, my lord, because we have taxpayer, we have recipient of the notice, but then there'll be persons whose information is included in the information that's sought. So um, to build up an idea of transactions, you might have um, a number of transactions of the taxpayer which involve other persons and so information about those transactions so the other person's information um, the entity's information would be included in the So you say it can't be go as wide as that so what do you, who do you say are the parties? Um, in my submission the party is just the HMRC officer is, is the party Well no sorry HMRC HMRC sorry mm -hmm. yes um, And the third party subject um, to the notice? No the that the, the, it, is, it is difficult, but in an originating application that's made ex parte, um, it, it's difficult because there's no dispute, my lord. That's, that's the great difficulty. Parties well, are you looking a gift horse dispute. in the mouth? I'm not saying I'm giving you this horse, but I mean, it seems to me there is quite an argument. In the case of an explicitly ex parte application, there are no other parties other than the applicant, or, although under the rules they're rather oddly referred to as the appellant. 
Now that gets us to the point that there doesn't have to be a hearing. Now it's true in this case that, um, that we're told the normal procedure is there is, but still I think it's quite a useful sub basis for all this to say there doesn't have to be a hearing at all. If that, that may not be your submission, but I just want to explore it. So that's why I was rather um, pedantically insisting on the premise of the hearing, because it depends what you mean by hearing. Because if, if the hearing is the well, okay, what I mean by a hearing, I mean that that uh, the judge simply reads the file. Yes, um, and that and may nobody still turns be, up. That no. may still be a hearing, my lord, because what what the hearing really? well boiling it down, my lord, the hearing might just be. Hear what the HMRC officer has to say who wants approval of this notice. So the paperwork that goes in that says, I want this notice for all these reasons, um, you know, it's, it's reasonably required for X, Y, Z reasons. Um, that could be like a, a, a permission um, on the papers kind of yes, um, right. consideration. Well, I wouldn't call that a hearing at all. You wouldn't I might call say. it a hearing at all, but you, you, you might say, as you indicated, that the rule might not mean you actually. Well, that was a different. That was no. in a different context. But well, I'm just. Can we just pin this down? What I want to know is what your submission is on whether uh, anyone's consent, except HMRC's, is required to not having a hearing, i.e., to be dealt with entirely on the papers in a two A case. And my submission is no one else's consent is required. Okay. Um, the question might be, is, is orality necessary for a hearing? Um, and perhaps we don't need to resolve that, because if a tribunal procedure is that normally, when considering this, we benefit from that interaction, as it were, orality is the way we want to do this, then... Um, well, I agree. This may be, this may be, it may be a red herring, but I think it's the well, red herring I still want to follow. I think hearing is where everything comes from. If you didn't have hearing, you wouldn't have open justice, you wouldn't have all these other principles, procedural fairness, etc., coming in. Because if it was just like, um, I don't know enough about it, but say you had a, a, a sort of, you wanted to do covert surveillance or something. Um, I'm afraid I don't know enough about the process for that. But you might have a process where it would be inconceivable that you'd have necessarily a sort of oral hearing about it because the way it happens to be done is because the documents have to be very secret and what have you, it's done in a very sort of sealed way just on the paper. Um, and perhaps you wouldn't call that a hearing. And it's this word hearing that has brought into the, the whole language of um, whether it has to be oral, whether it's inter partes or ex parte. Um, because really it's an examination. I mean, that's what's going on here. It's an examination by the judicial monitor of whether the information is reasonably required. And the tribunal do that by hearing from HMRC HMRC as to why it's reasonably required, but they might not agree with anything said by HMRC, but still form a view that actually, um, you know, the submissions weren't helpful at all or whatever, but very experienced in this field, they realise that there's that point and that point, and yes, the information is reasonably required. So the ultimate question is... Is that right? Doesn't the, doesn't the judge have to be um, satisfied that the officer is justified in thinking that the information is reasonably required. Um, I, I say I may be dancing on a yeah, you, here because I think you're because introducing it, things you don't well, need to introduce. I mean, the officer obviously thinks it is justified. It's whether the officer's got the right to consider it being justified. So, but it is helpful to actually boil right down to what Parliament really requires here, though, because it is the actual nature, and this is relevant to the authorities because when you look at the natural justice, the procedural fairness authorities as wise men. You can see that's really what the um, court is doing there. That the court looks at um, all of the judges, consider that the statutory scheme is key and is important. Um, and so if we, if we just turn up wise I believe it's right at the beginning of the court. Um, if we pick it up with Lord Reed on page 308. Um, by letter C. Um, just above that, really, for a long time the courts have, without <coughs> objection from Parliament, supplemented the procedure 
laid down in legislation where they found it to be necessary for this purpose. So you might be able to add to the procedure, but what you can't do is change the actual fundamentals. You can't change the role. Um, but before this unusual kind of power is exercised, it must be clear that the statutory procedure is insufficient to achieve justice and that to require additional steps would not frustrate the apparent purpose of legislation. <coughs> so if um, there's going to be supplementation, it can only be in those circumstances. So what you can't do is change the um, statutory scheme, as it were, even if it um, would be unfair not to do it, um, because that's judicial legislation, and that's what the um, later on some of the uh, judge, judges say in, in terms that there is this limit that you can't sort of have um, effectively judicial legislation that changes the nature of what's being undertaken. Um, it's, uh, if I go to page 316, again at C, <coughs> and what has just been looked at in that paragraph is this, um, you're familiar with the case, so you know it's the cancer state. That if, if the court held that natural justice required, in that case, that the um, commissioner's counter statement, so the sort of reply, um, be allowed to be replied to and, and have that taken into account. The decision could not stop there. We can see in the, the court says how these things do naturally extrapolate outwards from any small amount that's given. Inevitably, logically, it then expands. All this would go beyond presumed. Um, go beyond merely inserting into Section 28 provisions, which Parliament would have presumed to have intended in order to conform with natural justice. It would be the equivalent to new legislation. So, coming to the point that was really, I think, put to me initially, that, well, couldn't the tribunal do this and couldn't the tribunal do that if it thought it was convenient or would help? Um, my submission is that if the tribunal focuses on the actual question in hand, and doesn't open up the consideration of that merits question that <coughs> it's actually dealing with, which is only investigatory. It's, it's not a resolution of a dispute. It's not an umpire resolving a dispute. Um, it can't do that. It can't open it up for comment by... Because Parliament conspicuously, and this is what Darren says, does not provide for the comments of taxpayers, comments of the recipients of a notice, comments of these entities, to be um, considered by the tribunal. It may be that, as a matter of practice, HMRC will put the submissions made to HMRC in front of a tribunal, but that's not diluting the fact that Parliament conspicuously didn't do that. It provided for these safeguards, it made it very clear. The taxpayer gets a summary of the reasons. So that's it, that's not, and there's judicial findings on this, this is a finding in Darren, that allowing for the taxpayer to have a summary of the reasons is not to open up the procedure and say, and then to, you know, you get this and you get that, because it's inviting participation. That is the limit. That's what Parliament has said. That's the limit of the uh, involvement. And that clearly isn't direct participation in front of the tribunal on the, the, the matters in issue. It's informative. It's not inviting an active role to come and make submissions and give an opinion <coughs> that the tribunal should take into account the opinion of these um, bodies or individuals who aren't provided for in the statutory scheme. The statutory scheme says take this into account. Take into account the application made by HMRC. <coughs> and we can see that one of the reasons in Wiseman for the court um, taking what it obviously considered was um, in some ways quite a, a strict approach, is that Parliament had said you should take these three documents into account. This is what should be taken into account. And that was another indicator that Parliament intended this to be a limited consideration of what had been specified by Parliament, not to open it up to um, having submissions um, on the very issues. Uh, direct to the decision maker, the judicial 
moment. Can I just take you back to the definition of the parties? Yes. In the rules at tab 2, page 60. It's really a footnote to my Lord's question earlier, so just so I can be completely clear about your position. Do you have the interpretation provision in Rule 1? Yes. Appellant means, A, the person who starts proceedings. And one of the ways in which you could start proceedings is by making an originating application. Or, as a catch-all phrase, otherwise. So it looks as if HMRC, when they make this kind of approval application, are certainly starting proceedings. Yes. If I say anything you don't agree with, please correct me. So it looks as if they do fall within the definition of appellant there. Then, over the page, party means a person who is an appellant in proceedings before the tribunal. So fine, HMRC are a party to this kind of proceedings. But then we get the phrase respondent means to, in proceedings brought by HMRC alone, a person against whom the proceedings are brought or to whom the proceedings relate. Now, in the context of this kind of application, do you submit that that has any relevance or is it completely irrelevant? I very clearly dispute my learned friend's approach, which is he accepts, I think, that it can't be against whom the proceedings are brought because there's no one against whom these proceedings are brought. Well, it might be said that the third party, the subject of the application, is the query. Yes, I mean, as my lady indicated, it may be that the third party is entirely indifferent, as it were, and that it's the press of a button for them and there's no problem. It may be a third party is more concerned. But just, sorry to divert very slightly, but usually the concerns of third parties are about onerousness and what tends to happen is the application is slimmed down. It's not normally going to the merits of whether or not the information is reasonably required. It's more about the tribunal might redraft, as sometimes happens, the terms of the notice to take out things that are poorly expressed. And that's usually the idea that it's too poorly, it's too diffuse for them to actually operate and they need something more precise. So they may have something to say, but it's not necessarily against the notice. It might be something about the terms of the notice. Fine. But what about the phrase to whom the proceedings relate? Why is that not broad enough to encompass both the third party, the subject of the notice, and the taxpayer? Well, as my submission is, it really has to be, it depends what you mean by the proceedings relate. Because if it's, is it to whom the information relates? Is that why the proceedings relate to you? Because you have a connection through the information that the notice is concerned with? In which case, as I say, that's all those offshore companies and all the people who probably don't know anything about the, because Parliament hasn't said you have to serve these reasons on anyone other than the taxpayer, as it were. So if the, if those persons are parties under the parliamentary statutory scheme, there just is no role for them. They're not, so it's very odd to have a party who has no connection to the proceedings. Yes, but the point is, why isn't the taxpayer a person to whom the proceedings relate, even though the information is being sought for the third party? Because the information might relate to the taxpayer, but the question of whether the information is reasonably required isn't something that relates to the taxpayer. The taxpayer statute does not provide. Well, it's a more succinct way of putting it that the information may relate to the taxpayer, but the proceedings don't. Yes, because the proceedings are about the question of whether the information is reasonably required. And the proceedings are HMRC's application for approval of their investigation notice. And it may be that the taxpayer has an opinion or doesn't on whether the information is reasonably required. But don't worry about the taxpayer's opinion. That's not really the point. The point is, the point against you would be that as a matter of just a broad common sense and understanding, 
the proceedings, namely the proceedings to obtain information from a third party, relate to the person in respect of whose tax affairs the investigation is the information is sought. Why isn't that a reasonable way of reading the concept of to whom the proceedings relate? Because the proceedings relate to the application for approval of a notice. And the although a notice is in the context of a tax investigation and the information may or may not relate to that taxpayer, in fact, it might be information that relates to something else that may have a relevance to a taxpayer, but it's not their information. Well, it's, it's got to be about, tax. it's checking a taxpayer. Yes. Right. So there is a taxpayer in there somewhere. Yes. Right. And you're checking their tax position. So why doesn't, why don't the proceedings relate to the person whose tax affairs are being checked? Um, well, they relate indirectly in the sense that the reason for wanting the information ultimately is for an investigation, and the investigation is for checking the taxpayers. So there's that connection. But it's not, um, the question is not whether to have the investigation itself. So it's not that um, idea, it's not that direct connection, that very close connection. It is still at this preliminary <coughs> stage about obtaining information. So yes, it's relevant to you. I think if, if you were just saying relevant, um, then plainly it's relevant to the taxpayers. But to actually make them a party to proceedings is a bigger step. Than that. The real, well, the real problem is I very much doubt whether this phrase was chosen with these sorts of proceedings in mind. So how we apply them is to some extent purposive. Yes, and that's my opening submission, that you um, start with a statute and you think what the statutory scheme does and says and allows. And if you can, the procedural rules can't, it can't be the other way around. We can't fit everything to the procedural rules to make them work. Yeah. So if they just don't work very well, maybe they no, don't work I, very well. I, but I, I do understand that. But another way of approaching issues of interpretation can be to ask whether a provision would be completely redundant if it doesn't apply in this context. And, and I, I, for myself, I don't know at the moment whether there could be proceedings brought by HMRC alone. Uh, well, it's an ex parte where, process. Where, where there isn't somebody. Because this is clearly envisaging that there could be proceedings brought by HMRC alone, and yet where there is also somebody else to whom the proceedings relate. And not now necessarily, but if, if you were able to give us some assistance on another kind of proceeding where this provision would make perfect sense, then one might get some assistance from that because one could see that the provision is not redundant. It does have yeah. some scope for, for application. Yes, I can't speak to other cases. I think the answer here is just that the statutory scheme very clearly envisages the roles in this particular preliminary exercise of information gathering. And it doesn't envisage the role of the taxpayer as someone participating in this process. In a two way case. And um, it, it would allow for it if it did. I think it would be very clear. It wouldn't have just said a summary of reasons. Um, it would have made it clear that what is a monitoring role is, in fact, effectively more of a dispute. I mean, the strength of your case really is that, isn't this the, the way it has to be put? But given that the whole basis is a piece of primary legislation saying that the application can be made ex parte, in considering the question where, who is the who is a party for the purpose of the nature of the uh, nature of the he uh, hearing, you should take a restrictive view um, uh, about giving any role to. Uh, anyone other than HMRC. Yes, and the reason for that is because this is very deliberately chosen to be a monitoring scheme. It could so easily have just been um, a, a dispute. The judicial body, um, as I say, umpires the dispute. But in a sense, there's no dispute here. It's not. Um, it's, it's not necessarily not necessary to sort of shoehorn a dispute into this. So the court's resolving a dispute that. There may be proceedings, but they're not necessary proceedings to involve a dispute between parties. So if you haven't necessarily got a dispute, why do you need more than one party 
um, that what's happening is that you're, you're sort of changing the whole nature of it in order to fit into the words of the procedural rules. And my submission is that's just the interest in the fit. Do, do you think, forgive me, but do you, do you also say, as it's very conventional, you always interpret legislation as a whole yeah. and harmoniously? And, and therefore, do you say that we can get some guidance from Rule 19? Yes. Which, which makes, on your submission, it makes perfect sense, as I understand it, that this is a case or matter which is to be determined without notice. Or the involved, you, you say that, that that language perfectly it fits what's envisaged in a part 36, sorry, schedule 36 application, and therefore any other provision in these rules permitting the respondent to participate in the proceedings does not apply. Yes, my lord, my only caveat, I don't want to be refusing gift horses here, but my only caveat is that it talks about a respondent there, and I'm not sure it, it is this language of ex parte and respondent no, no, that I am concerned no, no. about. So, if, if there has to be a party. Um, this clearly says, well, that doesn't mean that it no, works. That's, but that's why I said yeah. one reads things harmoniously yeah. and as a whole. But yeah. this may give some insight into what, what's really envisaged. It, 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 is the present kind of proceedings, even if they are proceedings, which you accept they are, is that the kind of proceeding where it's envisaged that there will be a respondent? You say no. There is just one party. There's, there's just HMRC. And it's important because when the court looks at whether um, natural justice requires things to be read in a certain way and, and matters to be, um, the court's very, very clear that um, you can't uh, alter, in a sense, the statutory scheme. And if the statutory scheme very conspicuously doesn't provide a role, we're wondering, you know, what are these people here? That the statutory scheme, as Darren finds, has a very limited role for the taxpayer and it's not a role in the hearing, it's not a role in the um, approval process, it's simply an information aspect, you know, you will be given these, but therein finds, this court finds, that isn't um, in order to open the door to participation in the approval process, that's for a summary of reasons, it's, it's just for information, it's not to open the door to participation. So there is authority already, and I appreciate that Darren isn't looking directly at this point because it was taken as read in that case that um, there wouldn't be an inter partes hearing. It still is, as, as the upper tribunal finds and Judge Mosdell finds, it still is relevant in interpreting the statutory scheme that's there, that the statutory scheme in a sense does cover this, because the statutory scheme does say this is the role for the taxpayer. So, and it's as you can see, an ex parte application. And what would an ex parte application be if at some point it turns into inter partes, as it were? But um, I'd say the language isn't really helpful, but um, it is envisaging that you go to a court and you say, um, can I do this? It's not you go to a court and say, umpire this dispute. Can, can I just, uh, just finish off this train of thought? If we accept the submission that there doesn't have to be a hearing under Rule 29 unless HMRC want one, because they're the only party whose consent has to be obtained, it is nevertheless a case, we're told as a matter of practice, that there always are such hearings. We don't know why, that may just be cultural. Or it may be taking the view that it's actually healthy if you are need to make an ex parte order. You want to have the, you want to eyeball the person who's asking for it. Um, but you're not aware of any discussion anywhere of what or any practice note saying these things should always be here in the form of hearings. It's just no. how it's just how they are. No. Okay. Um, the, the other factor that might be relevant is, as I say, what happens at the hearing sometimes is the recasting of a notice. So the judge says, I'm not going to approve this. Yes. Mm. But if Don't you take that bit out, take that bit out. And so it is an interactive process. Don't get me wrong. Way. Speaking yeah. myself, I can see every reason for having uh, a face-to-face -face encounter to avoid yes. all these ambiguous terms. Between, um, but I still think it's helpful to the analysis, mm. um, particularly perhaps on the open justice side, to know whether this sandwich actually has to be a hearing at all. 
Yes, well, and, and, um, and say the language is where the problem or, or yeah, where okay, all the well, submissions that, that, that's helpful. Where the submissions on all the points come from. Because if it is in the hearing, then as, as my Lord indicates, you're not worrying if it's or or inter partes or all those questions. Mm -hmm. And um, in, if it's not a hearing, then the open justice aspects of it don't um, For open justice, of course, I don't know about the time, but for open justice, of course, it, it needs to be a, a dispute resolution in my, in my submission. It, it's not, um, I think we can't limit it too much by saying at what stage of the proceedings and what have you, but the whole point mm -hmm. is the judge is resolving a dispute. And that's where, where, do you, where, do you, where do you get that from, from the rules? Well, that's the general tenor of the... Um, put it the other way, that if that's um, <coughs> not very clear, put it the other way, that if it's a purely private sort of matter that doesn't involve something that the public's going to be sort of well, engaged with, then... Um, can we just have a look at the rules, please? Uh, because that may not be the end point, but it's certainly the start point. Um, yeah. Rules 30, 31 and 32 on page 77 really govern this. Uh, first of all, I think we can derive from these provisions that here, the word hearing is clearly being used to mean an oral hearing. Mm. Because a judge sitting in their room considering a file it, it's not something that you're going to say this is a hearing which must be held in public. Yes, right, yes. That's ludicrous. So, first of all, I think, I think we can agree about that. But the question I really have for you is this. Why doesn't Rule 32 set out the starting point that subject to the following paragraphs, all hearings must be held in public? The, the, if, if the HMRC application is being considered at a hearing, why does that not have to be, at least as a starting point, held in public? Um, clearly, the upper tribunal consider, you know, it may not have got the wording right and the reasons for the decision, etc., etc. So I'll come to the sort of technical point of this upper tribunal decision in a minute. But the, um, there is a difference between the first tier tribunal and the upper tribunal in this, in the sense that um, the first tier tribunal consider that because of the nature of the hearing, inherently, there isn't jurisdiction to hold it in public because okay. it's a monitoring role and that it flows from the nature of the hearing. The upper tribunal has taken the position that, yes, it is a hearing of that nature, um, and so in principle it can be um, in public. Um, and so they may not have got the wording right in this particular case, but it probably would be the, the situation, if you accept that premise, that these are the matters that the tribunal would be considering as to whether it should be in public or private. Um, and because of the... Um, you can actually see when they give their reasons normally that it's, it's the um, E, the privacy aspect, and C, yeah. which um, there might be a D sometimes, depending on how you define the public interest. Um, there might be cases that involve dramatic you know, schemes that you know, have a wider effect on these things. So there may be more, um, and it's not just the public interest in the collection of tax, there might be more. Um, but, uh, and obviously, all these you consider E anyway, whether it would prejudice the interest of justice. But, when you see why the um, the public is to be involved, as it were, you can see that this is there's always a spectrum. <coughs> that this is an, an area of a spectrum where the benefits of having the public there um, are, in my submission, not the most weighty benefits, and the uh, downsides, the cost of having the public there. Given that Parliament says it's a judicial monitor role. So it can't be said that Parliament really envisaged um, these to be public hearings. So you're looking at first principles to say, well, why should they be public? Um, because it's a monitoring role. I mean, the justification that's continually put forward is that the judge might um, not perform his function uh, appropriately, as it were. It's not so the public can interject at the hearing. It's to have a sort of um, discipline. That's the way of putting yes, it. Yes, well, and, um, this is all very familiar stuff, and I understand it all, but it's not what the rules say. If this is a hearing, then there are only certain limited circumstances in which it can't be in public. But the character of the hearing is always for um, natural justice and for um, open justice. It's always 
and these are not rigid rules. Well, they, they are rigid rules, aren't they? Am, no, am, am I missing um, something? No, my, Lord, um, there's two different things. There's the rules from the principle, which the, the, this reflects the underlying principles, doesn't it? The open justice Well, it principle. does, but it codifies yes. it into a rule. Yes. So, taking it in stages, clearly the open justice principles themselves are flexible, and so they don't demand a particular rule here, one way or the other. Um, you always look at the context, <coughs> you always look at the relative um, interests, as it were, the public interests, the, the different conflicting interests, and you come to a conclusion. It's very clear there aren't rigid rules on it. Then you look at whether these tribunal rules ought to impose um, rigidity into it. Um, and it, the other tribunal, as I say, is proceeded on the basis that, in principle, you have it here, but that the reasons are, um, these are, this is the type of hearing where these factors um, outweigh that first um, premise. So, so we're looking at 32.1, subject to the following paragraphs, all hearings must be held in public. The reason for that is the um, general principles. Um, but so those, that's where you get the principles in favour of public hearing, and then you can see that the on. Justification for that rule, and then you can see in two, these are the considerations you must always take into account. I think that it's considered to be a broad discretion by the tribunal. I don't think that 32 1 is taken to mean that there's a sort of presumption um, in the rules themselves. That means Clearly, you have to ha fall in um, 32.2 in some way. That can't be just the whim of the tribunal. The tribunal has to consider relevant considerations. But there's not a, a um, constraining provision. And, my lord, what's very important here is the statutory scheme and the high authority, which says that confidentiality is very important. So if you're not involving the taxpayer because of confidentiality, even though in effect it's probably they have more of an interest, the public interest in this sort of making sure the judge does his job in what's a very technical area um, clearly is something which is not going to be um, as weighty as in other areas where um, criminal justice, there are other areas where very clearly there's a, a public concern, as it were, and a, a, a real effect in terms of having it in public that's a beneficial effect. But those arguments in this particular area, given that the statutory scheme ranks confidentiality very highly at this investigative stage. Your submission really amounts, I think, to this, that implicitly, if not expressly, the other tribunal did go through the considerations in Rule 32 and clearly reached a decision that one or more of those factors, like protecting confidentiality of sensitive information, applies. And, 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 and it almost goes without saying, you say, you, you're going to be dealing with, by definition, the confidential affairs of taxpayers, for example. And, and that is, in fairness, really what they say, that because Derren and these other cases, Morgan Grenfell, have sat it, set very strongly that in the context of this statutory scheme, these proceedings, confidentiality is key, a key statutory purpose to maintain confidentiality, um, that when they're actually looking in that context at the, this, these, these um, uh, considerations, it's sort of given as read because Derren and Morgan Grenfell and the statutory scheme itself says that is key here. <coughs> so it's always in the context of that being um, established already that the tribunal is looking at the um, other factors. In the E case, uh, which is tab 21, in volume two, uh, another of Judge Mosdale's judgments. Um, she she um, addresses this question about private or not. And at page 503, if you have, if you have that in front of you. Yes, I have it. Um, about halfway down page 503, she's dealing with the subject of privacy. And she says at 78 that it is the invariable practice of 
scheduled registered tax because she could find them either. She refers back to her own judgment in Aries. And then she explains, and I think you essentially adopt her reasoning, don't you? Yes, and you also have Ariel in the bundle, um, yes, that cross-reference. So, um, I, I, I understand, and it's really going back to my Lord's point, but I understand what, what seems to have developed as the invariable practice of the FTT, and it now seems to be endorsed by the UT, but uh, it's not actually what Rule 32 says, and what Mr. Firth submits is, you, you've actually, this isn't just verbiage, you've got to go through this reasoning properly, and that it, you've got to ask yourself the right question, and secondly, he says, I don't know if he's right, but he says, there has to be cogent evidence. You can't just make a sort of generalised assumption that in every Schedule 36 application, there's going to have to be a private hearing. What do you say about that? Um, I think, well, this is coming at it from a sort of generalised perspective. Um, it may be that we've got a more processed approach from a tribunal because they have looked at this carefully on many occasions, as it were. So they haven't developed this practice or this approach um, in abstract. They've actually looked at it in real cases and considered in real cases. Well, what is the argument about having this in public? What would be the problem? So what we have here is the product of consideration. And you can see in the bundle, they've considered it from first principles. But when it comes to the tribunal in individual cases going through its reasoning, um, it may be the tribunal could be given guidance to, to sort of show your workings more, you know, show your... Um, but unless there's really a material error of law, unless... Um, because the tribunal are considering whether to have it in public or private to start off. The very fact they're considering now, when it said there's no jurisdiction, I can see that's a, a generalised approach that that you know has to be dealt with. But where what's being said is, well, um, there's an acceptance that this could be in public, so that's the starting point. Mm. Um, but we have daring, we have a statutory scheme, we have all this already in the learning. You can see they're cross referring to the learning, so everybody knows what the competing matters are. So it is in that context appropriate to look at in this individual case, why in this individual case, given that generally the balance falls this way, why in this individual case should it, the balance fall the other way? Why, sh why should it be? Yes, um, and I, I see in my submission as they they might be better to recite their workings, but they use cross-referencing to the other decisions as almost the working um, in terms of the general scheme of it. Um, and then they look at it on the individual case and say, why in this And this particular taxpayer is, in some ways, unusual, these taxpayers, because normally the taxpayer doesn't want it in public. Mm. So um, it, it's actually normally a situation where um, they're not um, the interest, the, the sort of interest in open justice, as it were, is not something that's being pressed by those involved. It is just the, the sort of general principles from the, mm. um, the, the sort of um, jurisprudence. Would the um, whole purpose of it being ex parte be defeated if the hearing were in public and people could attend and tell the taxpayer all that was said by the inspector or the officer, rather, um, my lady, the judge? My lady, my submission would be yes. Um, I think my learned friend would say there's a difference between attending and participating. and that um, I'm asking about attending and hearing what the officer might have to say to the judge in response to questions from the judge about the requirement for particular documents or information? It is my submission that the free discourse between the judicial monitor and the person asking for approval and notice is essential to the whole process. And that if you can constrain that discourse by having persons in the room that you don't know, um, you know what their role is, what their, um, it would, in my submission, restrict and that would actually be undermining the statutory um, intention, as well as, of course, the confidentiality aspect generally. So it would affect the proceedings and how well you can monitor. Um, and it would also mean that it's much harder to maintain confidentiality. And the more you limit in a sense, the more you're careful about confidentiality, um, the less the public will get out of it, because the public hasn't got the notice, hasn't got the 
And so the benefits of the public being there are becoming even more slight um, if you are trying to preserve confidentiality. So it's a, a um, tightrope walk that doesn't need to be undertaken in my submission in this particular context. Um, save if there, unless there is a case, and that's why I was saying reserve it at this level, because there may be some case that comes up that really illustrates something that's not been considered thus far that strongly points in favour of having a public forum. Um, but to speculate about it now in the absence of that particular instance in my submission isn't helpful. Um, but it is difficult to envisage a case where having the public there could in this particular context with judicial monitoring of quite complex considerations concerning an investigation that has to remain confidential is actually going to become public confidence. Uh, you, you may not know the answer to this, and I'm afraid I don't, uh, or I should. Um, routinely in the Crown Court, circuit judges, before they begin their trial for the morning at 10 o'clock, they usually, at 9 o'clock, will be dealing with production orders, which, which are not dissimilar to this kind of application, because they're usually made by the police, but the application is made by the police as part of an investigation. Um, do you know if, if the public are entitled to observe I'm afraid I don't know the answer to well, that, but I, I may be able to check. I don't think you know, but I think you may be able to. Um, the only observation I'd make is that obviously, um, as I say, natural justice and open justice are very context specific. So although it may assist me to have um, that particular uh, example, um, well, I it, I, I, it, it I, is important I, I, just entire, to look at entirely understand that yeah. point. And, and, not, and, and one of the points that you've made in your skeleton, and it's perhaps. Uh, doesn't need to be made explicit, but you do make, is that, of course, the end product of an investigation may, in fact, vindicate the taxpayer. Yes, absolutely. And if, in the meantime, they've had their name dragged through the public mud, as it were, yeah. that's not necessarily a good thing. And it may be that um, the public may not be terribly discerning on certain things, but it may be that a company whose name comes up, because I'd say this information may, may relate to these entities, so they're not the taxpayer, they're not the third party, so it's not the bank, it's, it's you know, some other entity. The name comes up in your hearing. It's a tax investigation. People might, you know, you can see that the context is one where um, because you can't, because the, the people coming in are not informed, because they're not coming in with the details of the application, they're not coming in. You can see that the Article 8 implications in terms of privacy, this is what one of the things looked at in Zarin was the sort of Article 8 implications for those who aren't directly involved with being taxpayers. Um, it, it is a consideration. There's always a balance, of course. But this is one way of assisting in the Article 8 um, balancing, is that you do it when it's necessary. And if it's not really necessary, if you're not really gaining anything from the public here, and the risks are um, there and real, then um, those are relevant matters too. So um, looking at the time, my lord, the, my submission is that it's not unreasonable. The approach the first tier tribunal has come to in terms of having a, a sort of after consideration, as you can see, having a, a sort of practice um, that uh, that is a shorthand. And insofar as this particular tribunal leans back on that, leans back on the arguments that have already been had, and just looks in this case as to well, why why should this case be treated differently to the how we normally treat these cases, why are the considerations different here. Um, that is a reasonable approach, but in any event, I would submit that any error of reasoning um, has to be material, and unless it really could have affected the outcome here, um, it obviously doesn't have to inevitably um, be shown that you know, it, 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 no other decision is inevitable. But um, in, in my submission, this is, you know, we are looking at material errors of law here. So if it's just not very well worded, it's obviously not appropriate to sort of set it aside and remit it to the tribunal because it hasn't expressed itself as well as it should have done. There has to be some real underlying error of law. Thank you. So um, I'm conscious that I haven't really taken you through all the documents, but I hope that you've seen um, enough to, to uh, I certainly don't know. I want to ask. I do, my lord and my lady do. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Anderson. Uh, yes, Mr. Firth. <coughs> Thank you, my lord. So I begin by just showing you the application 
So it relates, you say it relates in the case of a third party notice to both the taxpayer and the third party. Yes, my lord, and that's why they're both named on the mm. face of the, the application. Yep. Second, my learned, I think my learned friend appreciated this point, but if you were to say that, well, maybe they're not a respondent, then Rule 19 wouldn't be engaged. say one important thing about the procedure which says it may be made ex parte without notice, it says maybe made without notice yes. it doesn't say maybe determined without notice no, I agree it doesn't but. Um, and, and equally the fact that it may be made without notice equally implies it may be made with notice in which case it's all about to that, that point, point yes. is, is lost Thrust of my little friend's submission is, 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 is not based on the words of Schedule 36, but the gloss that's been placed on the Schedule 36, the interpretation of what the Parliament is trying to achieve here. So I, I submit that this Court shouldn't confuse what has been said in Schedule 36 with the Court's interpretation of the general purpose of Schedule 36. So I accept in Derrida this Court said, well, the general purpose here is a general a judicial monitoring system. Fine, I accept that. But that don't, you can't transplant that as if Parliament said that itself in Schedule 36, and equally you can't derive from that, therefore, no level of participation can be permitted whatsoever. It's, it's a non sequitur from saying that, in general, if a judicial monitoring purpose is identified, you wouldn't expect participation in many cases, to saying, but therefore, Parliament has prohibited. And that is the burden. That is the burden of my little friend's argument because quite clearly that the FCQ rules are permissive. Rule 5 gives quite a broad discretion to monitor and to conduct its own procedures. So my little friend actually has to find a prohibition in Schedule 36. It's just not there. And equally, then, when we come to Wiseman, then my little friend took me through um, a couple of passages. And the House of Lords does say, on the facts of that case, they couldn't see, it hadn't been shown there was anything unfair in the procedure adopted. But I, I took you quite carefully this morning through the, the three sections of the judgment, three um, lord, lordships, saying that, that we mustn't rule out that in an unusual case, where there's something that makes it appropriate, the tribunal having the power to, to do more than that. And if you, you can accept everything my learned friend said about Wiseman, but you still have to go to the rider. And the rider is essentially determinative of this case, because it says, do not go too far. Never say never. And there may be there may be good reasons why in most cases the tribunal will not allow participation. But, but to say that there's never going to be a case where, where it should be allowed would, would require quite considerable justification. And the House of Lords and Wiseman couldn't see it there. There's nothing here that, that, that leads you to that conclusion. So my submission, you can't reach that conclusion. My little friend had a number of threads um, weaving through her submissions as to why it'd be inappropriate. One was that, well, it would be difficult to stop wider submissions. Well, I think we have to give the FTP more credit than that. If it needs to, it can control its own procedure. It often happens that, that the tribunal needs to, to keep parties on track. So if the tribunal says this is the issue, we have to trust the tribunal will be able to keep. 
that body to that issue. It couldn't party. stop you appealing. Sorry? It couldn't stop the party that is dissatisfied from appealing and appealing again so that the whole process mushrooms out of control and what was intended to be a <coughs> speedy investigation uh, tool becomes a, a, a long-lasting, delaying, adversarial process. Well, we have to... Well, my, my point was, I think, slightly different. My, I, I was responding to... Well, you were talking about controlling the procedure. During the hearing. So my little friend said, if you, if you let someone turn up and say they can comment on a particular part of the case, how do you stop them going wide at that? And my, my simple submission was that, well, you, you trust the tribunal, and, and usually the parties, that, mm -hmm. that, that they'll be that sensible. My lady's, my lady's point is, I think, slightly different, that if you have a power to permit some level of participation, what do you do about frivolous appeals? Not necessarily even frivolous, but appeals. Uh, a, a party saying, in order to effectively participate, I want disclosure instance of the actual application and I want to see the statement of the officer in advance and then there's an appeal against that the refusal of those uh, uh, of those applications it, it, and so it mushrooms that's really what I'm saying <coughs> excuse me it's so it builds on what Ms. Anderson said that, that 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 is a possible risk in any any form of um appellate system, but there are <coughs> safeguards in place that are supposed to stop that both in ordinary proceedings and you'd expect to stop here. So, I mean, the tribe you need permission. You can't go automatically. And we know that in case management decisions, if the courts apply, tribunals apply the right test, then you're on very shaky ground in saying that they haven't reached a, a permissible conclusion. So, yes, a possibility, my lady, but not one that in my submission should rule out. And equally, um, if the ha go back to Wiseman and the House of Lords, I mean, they, they there identify a power. Now, it, it must be true there that you could apply, they exercise that power and you get refused it and you try and appeal it. So the possibility of people challenging um, a decision, yes, yes, it exists, but in my submission can't govern the interpretation of the system. You know, say a power doesn't exist because people might try to I understand the points you're making, but, but as I understood her submission, one of the points Miss Anderson is making, which I have to say does strike a chord with me, because, because I, I, I've had to conduct closed hearings quite often in, in various contexts. Uh, it was the point she made about free discourse. And there could be a real risk because the judge initially, at least, doesn't necessarily know the full complexity of the case. And that even by asking certain questions, things can be said which perhaps should not be heard by others. And that their full significance may not be appreciated by the judge. But the, bur the burden and the initiative for, for asking for a hearing in private lies with HMRC, and so you have to, I mean, it lies with, in any case, the party who says it should be in private, and that, that party can be expected to have considered whether it might be appropriate in this case to be in private, to put together a coherent and persuasive explanation, and then, and then put it before the judge, supported by evidence and, as described in the practice direction. So, that, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt you. I don't think it's quite addressing the point I'm making, which I think was also being made by is frankly the risk of inadvertent disclosure. And it can happen sometimes until the judge says something. That, that, that I would refer you back to Carol Ambers, where one of the concerns was, well, th this, this material was withheld at the magistrate's level. That was required to be ex parte, it was required to be in private. Now we're in the judicial review court testing whether that was a legal decision to grant a warrant. No dispute that it's an inter-party um, um, hearing. No dispute that the tax, sorry, the, the <coughs> is entitled to see um, the basis upon which the magistrate granted the warrant, subject to withholding information on public interest grounds. And therefore, that raises exactly the same point, the same risk that my lord has identified <coughs> and a friend relies upon. Of, well, there's an elephant in the room, which is this confidential information. What should we do about it? And the answer that, that, 
forward is, well, open justice must prevail to the maximum extent. You don't go down the line of um, presumption of regularity like in Rosco, for instance, which is true. Now, instead, you have a hearing before the Judicial Review Court, which is in open court as much as possible, but may require a closed material procedure where the judge gets to see this closed material and rely upon it to say, yes, that was a lawfully issued warrant. And that, that is the same, in my submission, that is the same risk um, as my Lord is relying, uh, suggesting and my learned friend has relied upon. And if they can deal with it in that context through appropriate use of procedures, they can deal with it in this context through appropriate use of procedures. And again, we, we, we end up back in the, in, the, in the area of discussion that, that arose this morning of, well, when you grant, the, if you grant the taxpayer some right of participation, you're not necessarily saying um, they may participate in the whole, the whole hearing or, 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 or even present or, or, orally saying that they get to um, deal with the concern of the tribunal. It may be most efficiently done in an oral hearing, um, but that, that's the consideration. And this, the second point I make on this is, is the, yes, my learned friend points to Darren, where they talk about um, risk of breaching the confidentiality of the investigation. And they say in many cases, there might be some elements of confidentiality of the investigation. But you cannot take the particular or the assumption in many cases, and therefore construct a general rule. Because if, if you have a case where there's no risk of breach of confidentiality, because frankly the taxpayer knows. I can't, I can't say that this is such a case, but we certainly had detailed evidence from the officer supporting um, in response to our closure notice application. So it's, it's quite conceivable that there are a large number of cases where, where the state of the investigation, the concerns of HMRC are known to the taxpayer. And the tribunal in that case will say, well, there's, there's no concerns of confidentiality here. And so that's why I'm saying that the, the risk of jumping from the, from the, well, we can see that concern existing in some cases, or even many cases, saying, and therefore, here's a general rule subject to no exceptions, is a step too far. The appropriate response to that, as you see in Haralambus, is to say, there are concerns that may exist in some cases, and when those cases exist, it's up to, in this case, HMRC, to let us know that that's a, this is such a case, we can deal with it. And that, in that instance, is for a closed materials procedure on judicial review. So yes, there may be cases, even possibly many cases, but um, my key submission is you don't get from that to a general um, never, um, not at all possible rule. One point I did want to mention before, the hearing is defined in Rule 1, but there was a discussion about what hearing means. It, it means ah, thank you. Uh, I had not sure spotted that. that. Sorry, does it say oral hearing? It does. Yeah. Well, it says two-way communication. You, you, you can, uh, means an oral hearing that includes a hearing conducted in whole or in part by video link, telephone, or other means of instantaneous two-way electronic communication. Yes. So it, it, it is. So when you have the oral hearing referred to, sorry, when you have hearing referred to in Rule 29, and my Lord was right, it's, those conditions are cumulative, and therefore we are, as I submitted earlier, we are a party, which is always common, then, then it's not possible to, to have it without a hearing. And we know in practice there is a hearing. I mean, my learned friend can try and sort of put a spin on it, well, it's more of a, an interrogation or something like that, but in the terms of the the rules, it's clearly a hearing. And that brings you then into Rule 32. And I urge caution on the because my, le my learner friend's arguments are obviously directed at this case and what HMRC is seeking to achieve here, but Rule 32 applies in all tax cases. And the, the learning from those tax cases, the uh, uh, decision in the authorities bundle will be the tab 18, um, it's clear that the, the approach is as set out in the practice direction. And so there's a risk you dilute or were to consider diluting Rule 32 for this case, where does it end? What about a closure notice here? What about other sorts of proceedings? And the point about open justice is, is my learned friend hasn't provided you with any authority to say it's, it's sort of an a la carte menu, you sort of have a think in this particular case, should we apply the rules with full vigor? In my submission, no. 
open justice is fundamental. The Supreme Court said it in Hernandez. It's there on the face of the practice direction, which is actually concerned with applications for interlocutory injunctions in case to restrain the publication of confidential other material that shouldn't see the light of day. So it's a situation where there may be lots of private interest in having a private hearing, but nevertheless, the full force of open justice applies there. And in my respectful submission, the full force of open justice applies in these sorts of cases. And it is not good enough, it is not right, that there can be some sort of presumption overriding the practice direction, which is based on lots of case law. And it is not right that HMRC, if they want a private hearing, can sidestep the need to justify it in a particular case and justify that nothing less than a private hearing would do. And that's where we seem to have ended up, because as a matter of course, these are held in private. As a matter of course, HMRC don't provide any justification or evidence. That's not a criticism of HMRC in this case, it's just the way that things are being conducted, it seems. But once we're in Rule 32, and I think it's agreed that we are in Rule 32, that applies across the full First Year Tax Tribunal. And as I said this morning, private confidential taxpayer details are routinely aired in public in that tax tribunal, things that lots of my clients, lots of my learned friends' clients would prefer not to see the light of day. But that's just the consequence of open justice, that if you have a tribunal system, you have Rule 32, you have open justice, and unless you can prove that nothing less than the exclusion of the public is necessary, they must be allowed in. And to say, well, they won't get much from it, has never been accepted as a good enough reason to say, well, the public couldn't possibly understand technical points of tax law, couldn't possibly understand technical points of Schedule 36. It's never been accepted as a good enough reason. It's not for the courts to second-guess the public's interest. We start from a very strong presumption and see what cogent evidence we have. My lords and my ladies, thank you very much for your attention. I see that we're out of time. Thank you both very much. We will, of course, be reserving our decision. That means that the judgments will be circulated in draft in due course for the parties to seek to agree the terms of a consequential order and to provide short written submissions if they're unable to do so, so that we can make the order at the time of hand-down and also, of course, to correct any typographical or other minor factual errors. My lord, before the court rises, I just remember that throughout the day there have been a few requests for additional documents and submissions on, for example, jurisdiction. I wonder if we could just try and agree. Yes, can we just do a checklist? Well, these are the ones that I'm conscious of, which are the easier ones. I think we would like to see the skeletons below. And we would like to have the most authoritative reports of any that are not in the most authoritative versions. You'll have to check that. Speaking for myself, but my lord and my lady may not have the same view, I feel clearer now having heard the argument about the jurisdictional basis of the appeal and of the other procedural points which we had to look at. So I'm not myself asking for further work on those, but we're in the same position. So those are really the only two points that I am aware of. But if either you or those behind you noted anything else and are unclear about it, please let us know. It doesn't sound as though my lord or my lady have anything else in mind. So it may actually not be as bad as it seemed. I'm great. Right. Eyes. Thank you.